Hello, I'm Bruno Adorno and I'm delighted to give this talk today about our work on robot modeling, control and planning using dual quaternion algebra. Modern robotic systems can be very complex, both in terms of complex dynamics and kinematics, but also in terms of the complex environments where they are supposed to work. Also, there is a growing expectation for the robots of today to handle complex tools, as well as to interact with humans and even other robots. The possibilities are endless, as well as the challenges involved in the development of such complex systems. The complexity of such systems can be overwhelming and several questions naturally arise. For instance, which one is the best? Model-based or data-driven methods? Should we use physical models using first principles or pure mathematical models are sufficient to capture all the underlying phenomena of those complex robotic systems? What is the best strategy? A unified theory that uses a single representation or, in other words, a theory of everything in robotics? Or perhaps it is better to use several available mathematical representations to solve a given problem. As a matter of fact, can all problems in robotics be defined mathematically in the first place? Although it is not clear if all problems in robotics can be well defined mathematically, this is something for philosophers to discuss and I'm more than happy to discuss about it afterwards. At least several important robotics problems can. But even if a given problem can be represented mathematically, is it feasible to do so? More specifically, does the system complexity not result in an overly complex mathematical description that alienates practitioners? Also, how do we find models that are suitable for controller design? How about describing high-level tasks that can be easily translated into low-level controller references? How to interface with other techniques that are not so reliant on mathematical descriptions? Although I do not have answers to all those questions, or at least some answers are not as satisfactory as I would like them to be, I will present our recent efforts in addressing some of those challenges. First, we use a bottom-up approach, where different levels in the robot architecture are connected by algebraic structures, which is somewhat math-intensive, but only one algebra is used, namely dual quaternion algebra. We use dual quaternion algebra for modeling, control, high-level task description, and planning. Because only one algebra is used, the math is more manageable and we do not have problems with intermediate maps that can lead to math incompatibility, such as unnecessary singularities, unnecessary discontinuities, etc. Now, I will provide a very brief overview of the dual quaternion algebra. Dual quaternions extend quaternions, which in turn extend complex numbers. Given the imaginary units i, j, and k, the set of quaternions is defined analogously to the set of complex numbers, where we have a real part and an imaginary part that contain terms multiplied by the imaginary units. Dual quaternion algebra has one more special unit, often called dual unit and denoted by epsilon, which is different from zero, but epsilon square equals zero. Dual quaternions are composed of two quaternions, the one that is not multiplied by the dual unit is called the primary part, and the one multiplied by the dual unit is called the dual part. Therefore, the dual quaternion set is an eight-dimensional manifold that is a superset of the set of quaternions, which in turn is a superset of the set of complex numbers. Furthermore, the set of dual quaternions, when written in hyper-complex notation, is equipped with the standard addition and multiplication operations, analogously to complex numbers. One needs only to respect the properties of the imaginary units and the dual unit. 
Dual quaternions can be used to represent rigid motions, twists, wrenches, and several geometrical primitives such as line, planes, infinite cylinders, spheres, etc. For instance, the rigid motion between two frames are denoted by a unit dual quaternion X, where the primary part contains a rotation quaternion R, in which phi is the rotation angle around the rotation axis N and P is a translation quaternion. Also, a sequence of rigid motions is given by a sequence of dual quaternion multiplications. A line, here denoted by L under bar, is composed of the line direction in the primary part, denoted by L, and the cross product between an arbitrary point P on the line and its direction in the dual part. Moreover, a line equipped with a radius gives an infinite cylinder. On the other hand, a plane, here denoted by pi under bar, is composed of the plane normal n and its signed distance d to the reference frame. These are just a few examples of how dual quaternions are used to represent different mathematical objects, but they may be used to represent virtually anything that can be embedded into an eight-dimensional space. Unit dual quaternions are more compact than homogeneous transformation matrices. They have only eight parameters. They form one of the smaller groups that represent rigid motions. Of course, both represent the six-dimensional manifold of rigid motions, so both representations have constraints. For instance, a general dual quaternion has eight components, but unit dual quaternions have two constraints. So, the underlying manifold has six dimensions, as expected. They do not have representational singularities, although this is not exclusive of unit dual quaternions, as homogeneous transformation matrices also do not have representational singularities. Nonetheless, dual quaternions have strong algebraic properties that are useful when transforming several primitives between different coordinate systems. For example, given the unit dual quaternion XAB that provides the rigid motion from frame A to frame B, a line with respect to frame B is represented in frame A by means of the adjoint transformation. In addition to lines, this transformation is used to transform twists and wrenches between different coordinate systems. Analogously, a plane with respect to frame B is represented in frame A by means of the sharp adjoint transformation. Therefore, dual quaternions are useful not only because we can use them to represent different mathematical objects, but because we can find useful relations between those objects by using a very small number of op operators. Last but not least, Dual quaternions can be used directly in the control law, without the need to extract parameters. This way, we avoid intermediate mappings that usually cause algorithmic or representational singularities. But of course, our main interest in dual quaternion algebra is about its applications in robotics. We use it to model serial kinematic chains, some parallel kinemat kinematic chains, especially those associated with cooperative manipulation, and also branched mechanisms such as humanoids. Let us take one of the simplest examples, a serial manipulator. Given all the intermediate unit dual quaternions that represent the rigid motion between two adjacent frames, the end effector pose with respect to the base frame is given by the multiplication of all those unit dual quaternions. This is analogous to homogeneous transformation matrices, but the cost for calculating the forward kinematics using dual quaternions is smaller than the cost when using homogeneous transformation matrices. The differential kinematics is given by the equation VEC8 of x dot equals j times q dot where x dot is the time derivative of the end effector pose. J is the analytical Jacobian matrix, which is found using dual quaternion algebra 
and q dot is the time derivative of the configuration vector. We can combine smaller modules into more complex ones. For instance, let us consider a mobile manipulator composed of a mobile base, a torso, and two arms. Each subsystem has its own differential kinematic model. They can be combined to obtain the whole body differential kinematics, which relates the time derivative of the whole body configuration to the time derivative of a unit dual quaternion of interest, which can be one that represents one of the end-effector poses, for example. Those whole body models are very useful when performing motion control because the whole, uh, whole kinematic chain is used, resulting in a highly redundant system. These can be exploited to perform additional tasks such as obstacle avoidance while performing the manipulation tasks. We have also been working on robot dynamics within dual quaternion algebra. We have proposed a recursive Newton-Euler formulation for a serial manipulator using only dual quaternion algebra. The forward recursion is used to obtain the twists and their derivatives for the center of mass of all robot links. And the backward recursion is used to obtain the wrenches at the robot joints. This formulation is very high level thanks to the dual quaternion algebra and very general. For instance, it takes into account arbitrary twists, hence arbitrary joints. Of course, at some point, the problem must be instantiated to a specific joint, but this is straightforward in our formalism. We have also proposed a method based on Gauss' principle of least constraint, which can be useful to account for constraints in the robot dynamics. Nonetheless, there is still a lot of work to do and, for the moment, we only tackled the dynamic modeling of serial manipulators. We take advantage of those models within dual quaternion algebra to design controllers with interesting properties. For instance, we have been working on constraint controllers that take into account both equality and inequality constraints explicitly in the control law. Although those controllers do not depend on a particular representation, we do use geometric primitives from dual quaternion algebra to enforce constraints. We have also been working on impedance admittance controllers as well as motion controllers, which respects the topology associated with the group of rigid motions. Since I don't have time to present all those controllers in detail, I'm going to present the most recent ones, which I find particularly interesting. I also invite you to see the presentation here on IRAS 2020 of our Robotics and Automation Letters paper on admittance control using dual quaternion logarithmic mapping. In order to illustrate the constraint constro controllers, let us consider a n-dimensional task vector and the task Jacobian that satisfies the robot kinematics, where Q is the robot configuration. Here, task vector can refer to different geometrical entities that we may want to control. For instance, we may want to control the end effector pose, the center of mass of a humanoid robot, the relative pose between the end effectors of a multi arm system, or the configuration of a plane attached to the robot end effector. All those geometric objects are easily represented as dual quaternions and their corresponding Jacobian matrices are easily found by using dual quaternion algebra. One of the simplest and most popular constraint controllers is given by the solution to a quadratic optimization problem subject to linear constraints on the control inputs. The objective function is composed of two terms. One of them is used to impose a desired closed-loop error dynamics, which in this case is given by a first-order ordinary differential equation. The other one is used to minimize the joint velocities. The closed-loop system is Lyapunov's table, and the control inputs can be computed in real time. Also, nonlinear constraints on the robot configuration can be enforced by using appropriate differential inequalities. Therefore, even though the constraints must be linear on the control inputs, 
Nonlinear constraints can be defined, which is particularly interesting because it, it is simple to define geometrical primitives within dual quaternion algebra, and it is also easy to perform algebraic manipulations to find the corresponding gradients and Jacobians. The main idea is this. First, geometric primitives are attached to the robot. Then, a region of interest is defined. This can be a region that the robot must avoid, as in the case of obstacle avoidance, or a region in which the robot must be confined, which is useful when performing what we call task relaxations. The distance between a given primitive and the region of interest is given by a differentiable function of the robot configuration. When the distance, func distance function is greater than zero, then the primitive is outside the region. Conversely, when the distance function is negative, the primitive is inside the region of interest. Furthermore, since the distance function is differentiable, its time derivative is written as a function of the time derivative of the robot configuration. To keep the primitive outside the region of interest, we enforce this differential inequality, which is equivalent to the expression on the right. Conversely, to keep the primitive inside the region of interest, we just reverse the inequality. Here we have an example where we control the yellow point robots to drive them to the corresponding green targets on the left. The robots must avoid the red disk, so we define a suitable distance function that gives the distance from a given robot to the disk boundary. The approximation velocity decreases exponentially, but velocities tangential to the boundary are not attenuated. Moving obstacles or other moving primitives can also uh, be taken into account in the vector field inequalities, but their velocities must be av available or estimated. We use those inequalities to perform collision and self-collision avoidance, to avoid joint limits, and also to define forbidden regions in task relaxations. For example, when placing a cup on a tabletop, instead of controlling the end effector to a desired pose, which would require 6 degrees of freedom, we may relax the task requirements and define a region where the cup must be placed, such as the red one. Although this would require, in the best case, just one degree of freedom, the end effector would likely do undesired motions. Therefore, those blue planes constrain the end effector to a region and the tilting constraint prevents the robot from dropping the cup's contents. In this experiment, we used a constraint controller based on the second-order differ di differential kinematics, which has a different formulation from the one I have just shown you, but the idea is the same. We have also applied the constraint controllers with vec vector field inequalities to surgical robots. This was done in the context of a research collaboration between UFMG and the University of Tokyo, where the goal was to develop techniques for endonasal and pediatric surgeries. The constraints were defined to prevent collisions between the two robots involved in the surgical procedure. We also used compliant pivoting points to prevent collisions between the tool shafts and the anatomical module. In one of our experiments, the surgeon had to perform an incision of the latex membrane. He was teleoperating the right tool while the left tool was autonomous. The control law takes into account both tools and vector field inequalities are defined to prevent collisions between the left and right tools and between the tools and the surgical workspace. The left tool, which was supposed to stay at rest at a specific location, gives way to the right tool to prevent collisions. Although, at a first glance, the behavior may be similar to the one obtained by using potential fields, the differential inequalities do not generate repulsive fields. Instead, the velocities normal to the boundary of the region of interest, which in this case is a cylinder enclosing the tool shaft, are attenuated. 
Here, the surgeon performs some procedures inside the mock-up of an infant's thorax. In the first one, the surgeon must transfer triangles from one side of the peg transfer, transfer board to the other. This is usually done for training purposes. There is an entry sphere constraint that could be used to enable the surgeon to use the compliance of the infant's skin to increase the reachable work workspace. Also, there is a cuboid constraint to limit the workspace and prevent manipulations outside the surgeon's field of view. Also, the robot joint limits were considered. The surgeon was also able to perform a suturing procedure, although this task was considerably more difficult than the peg transfer task. We have also used constraint contro controllers in whole body motion control, where the whole body model that I presented before is used. In this case, we used a low-cost non-holonomic mobile manipulator where the task was to drop a small object into the basket. The advantage of using a constraint controller is that the non-holonomic constraint of the mobile base is naturally enforced as an equality constraint. Of course, there are different formulations for constraint controllers and different, different optimization problems can be used to induce different behaviors. This formulation, for instance, may be used to generate sparse control inputs in which just the minimum number of joints will be actuated at a given time. The decision regarding which joints will be actuated at a given instant is made entirely by the controller you see on the screen. However, proving important properties such as closed-loop stability for arbitrary optimization problems can be very difficult. A very promising solution is to use stable-by-design constraint controllers where the objective function quantifies how adequate a given control input is. The inequality constraints are used to enforce the vector field inequalities and there is a Lyapunov constraint that ensures that the closed-loop system is stable. All the aforementioned controllers are centralized, but they are not feasible when we consider a multi-agent system with a large number of agents. Therefore, a decentralized approach is necessary and relevant abstractions must be used to account for heterogeneous systems. Let us consider a multi-agent system that must coordinate to achieve a desired formation. First, each agent is represented by its end effector pose. This abstraction is very convenient because different robots may be used, such as mobile manipulator, free-flying robots, humanoids, etc. Each agent has information related to its own desired relative pose, which can be time-varying with respect to the center of formation. However, since the, sense of the center of formation is not known, the formation can happen anywhere in, this, in the workspace. Also, only local information is exchanged, which means that each robot only needs the information of its neighbors and effectors poses. The goal is then to reach a consensus about where the center of formation should be. Here on the left, we see the time the time varying desired formation. On the right, all agents start in a random configuration, configuration and by means of local information exchange, they reach an agreement on the center of formation, which is given by a unit dual cochainian. Since the center of formation is not known a priori, a priori, its pose is completely arbitrary, but the desired formation is not. As a result, the formation can be anywhere in the workspace and its center can have any orientation, but the shape, of course, is specified by the time varying formation. Here we see the decentralized control law, which generates a control, si control signal for the ITH agent. This control signal is nothing more than a tangent vector at the unit dual quaternion 
corresponding to the agents and effector poles. We also have the information about the JTH and effector poles where AIG is zero if there is no communication between the ITH and the JTH agents and one otherwise. The term in red provides velocity information about the time varying formation. If the formation is constant, this term equals zero. An interesting feature of this decentralized control law is that it takes into account the complete pose and respects the topology of the space of rigid motions. Also, it is a useful abstraction. Hence, a group of heterogeneous agents can be used because all that is needed is the information about their end effector poses. Nonetheless, the robot differential kinematic model can be explicitly used to de generate the low-level control inputs. Thanks to the abstraction, humans can participate in the formation, as long as some robots are able to track the pose of their, of their hands. In this experiment, both robots communicate with each other, but just one of them has the information about the human hand pose. As a result, the formation is always a function of the human hand pose. This can be very useful in a situation where the robots are in charge of transporting bulky or heavy objects while the human is responsible for taking the formation to a desired location by using simple gestures. But how about high-level task description? Is it possible to define high-level tasks that can be easily translated into references for low-level controllers? This problem is not easy, especially if we consider general tasks, as we can see by recurrent efforts in integrating task planning with motion planning in the literature. However, we've been working on a formalism tailored for manipulation tasks, which is less general, but easier to tackle. The formalism is based on a new algebraic structure, more specifically a dioid, whose elements are composed of elements of dual quaternion algebra that represent poses, twists, and wrenches. Those elements are sufficient to represent a large class of manipulation tasks. More specifically, each element of the set of manipulation tasks represents a state or an action to be executed. By defining appropriate composition operations, we can use a symbolic state space that is closely related to the low-level controllers because each element of the symbolic state vector contains low-level information. Thanks to the operations provided by the proposed algebraic structure, we can easily combine simple models to generate more complex ones. For example, we can combine models related to the manipulation of a drawer, a cabinet, cabinet door, and a small object to obtain a complete model that specifies all that can be done in the scene. In this demonstration, in the beginning, there is a cube inside the drawer, and both the drawer and the cabinet door are closed. The desired state is the cube inside the cabinet in bo and both the drawer and the cabinet door closed. Since the generated plan has information on all relevant poses, twists and wrenches to accomplish the task, that information is used as references for the low-level motion controllers. Because all modules and low-level controllers are written using dual quaternion algebra elements, there is no need for intermediate for intermediate mappings, which helps avoiding pitfalls resulting from those mappings, such as unnecessary singularities and unnecessary discontinuities. Finally, I'd like to present DQ Robotics, a computational library that bridges the gap between the theoretical aspects of dual quaternion algebra and practical implementation. For instance, the key robotics was used in all works shown in this presentation. The library is available in three languages, namely Python, MATLAB, and C++, all of which share a unified programming style to make the transition from one language to another as smooth as possible.
enabling fast prototype to release cycles. Furthermore, a great effort has been undertaken to make coding as close as, close as possible to the mathematical notation used, used, used on paper, so it is easy to implement code as soon as one has grasped the mathematical concepts. Also, the library was designed to be used on real robots, so both C++ and Python have high, high performance. It features classes for robot modeling, control, the definition of geometric primitives, all of which use dual quaternion algebra. Therefore, it is straightforward to implement constraint controllers such as the one used in the simulation you see right now. Summing up, using appropriate mathematical descriptions, modeling, control, and planning can be mathematically unified in the sense that only one representation is used. Also, dual quaternion algebra has proven to be a suitable tool thanks to its rich algebraic structure that operates on an eight-dimensional space. Dual quaternion elements are compact but can be enriched as needed to account for more geometrical physical information. For instance, our dioid described earlier operates on a manifold with 18 dimensions. It provides useful abstractions that can be used to describe complex robotic systems and other agents, such as humans. Since geometry and algebra are tightly coupled, algebraic operations have a strong geometrical meaning. Therefore, geometrical reasoning, which in classic, classic representations is oftentimes done by inspection, and not rarely, by some degree of intuition, is done here through algebraic manipulations. Nonetheless, there is still a lot of work and several challenges. In my opinion, a promising research direction is on the coupling between high-level task descriptions and low-level motion controllers. What I have presented in that regard is just pre preliminary work, but we should motivate the research on alge algebraic structures to bridge the gap between high-level symbolic planning and low-level low level control. From an, al an algebraic point of view, there are still some parts of the current models and controllers that rely on real matrix algebra, for instance, when interfacing with real vectors. One example is when we use the VEC operator. In my opinion, a better understanding of matrices whose elements may contain dual quaternions may unveil new design techniques. There is still considerable skepticism due to the understandably utilitarian widespread point of view that favors classic representations over dual quaternion algebra. After all, robotics is a very practical field and most roboticists want to use tools that help them solve their problems. This is one of our motivations to develop and maintain the DQ Robotics Library, but the literature still lacks an undergraduate level or an introductory graduate level robotics textbook based entirely on dual quaternion algebra. This is a personal project that I've been working on for a while now, and I hope to solve that matter soon, although some of my colleagues and students have been hearing that for a while, so I understand their impatience and skepticism. Nonetheless, there is a draft publicly available that you may want to take a look at. And finally, of course, I didn't do everything by myself, and I'd like to thank all my collaborators and graduate students, especially my current team. Before ending my presentation, it is a great pleasure to present the next speaker. Dr. Betacharya is an assistant professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering and Mechanics of Lehigh University. He completed the PhD in Mechanical Engineering and Applied Mechanics and was a postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Mathematics at the University of Pennsylvania before he joined the Lehigh University. 
His research interests are centered around motion planning and control of autonomous and intelligent systems. More specifically, he is interested in applications of topological and geometric methods to the design and analysis of algorithms in robot motion planning, coverage, sensor, sensor networks, distributed systems, and control. Now it's his turn. Thank you very much for your attention.